So we are in the middle of our Beats series. So this is about forming missional rhythms in our lives. So taking our normal everyday lives and infusing them with kingdom intentionality. So, uh, so Beats, B-E-A-T-S, stands for? Oh, they put it up there, it's cheaters. <laughs> So it's a framework for our life where, where we seek to bless, where we seek to share meals with one another, where we seek to abide with the Holy Spirit, training in Christ's likeness and living as sent ones, as missionaries, as we all are. So last week, I spoke about the rhythm of eating. So it's to, uh, creating opportunity as we share meals, but to c- connect with non-Christians, Christians, people in your life, uh, in your church community, uh, but also people who don't know Jesus, just finding opportunities as you share three meals a day, inviting people in and connecting with them over a meal. Could be at work, at lunchtime, uh, doing that. And you're just seeing the opportunity of what comes out of that hospitality being uh, a gift from God, a spiritual gift even given to us to reflect the reality of God's kingdom. All right, so we are at abide today. So the rhythm of abiding, and it is abiding in Holy Spirit, listening to His guidance and direction. So it's that we have a rhythm, so part of our life, whether it's a daily rhythm, a weekly rhythm, that we are setting apart time to spend with the Holy Spirit, learning His voice, and then listening for His guidance and direction. As Jesus is our Lord and not just our Saviour, He doesn't just save us from sin and death and hell and and invite us one day to spend eternity with Him, but He invites us to live in that reality today. And that's His Lordship, that He is Lord, He is God, He is Lord over our lives. We gave up our life and gave it over to Him in exchange for His life. But it means then in our daily lives, we need to be listening to His guidance. Uh, We need to be listening to the direction that He has for our lives and then obeying what He calls us to do. So the first question you might be asking is, who is the Holy Spirit? Uh, The Holy Spirit is the third member of the Trinity. So we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I like to, and I think this has probably came out of like Bethel Church, some of the language, um, and, and I changed my language. I used to call Him the Holy Spirit. Um, but as, you know, God the Father, it, we just call Him God, <laughs> Father God. Uh, you know, we call Jesus, Jesus. Uh, and so I just like to call Him Holy Spirit, like that's His name. First name Holy, last name Spirit, maybe. Um, it's not, you know, Jesus, is, his, his surname isn't Christ, it's it just means Jesus, the anointed one. So that's a little, there you go, freebie tidbit. Um, so he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are one and the same. So one God in three persons, three expressions of the one God. So when we encounter the Holy Spirit, we are encountering God, the fullness of God. I, I, it's, it's a concept that kind of may be hard to wrap your head around, um, but that's what the Bible expresses, not specifically in using that word Trinity, but we understand the equality with God. And this is what we call, who knows I'm gonna say, ontological equality, functional subordination, okay? So one thing I learned from Bible college, um, ontological equality, so ontology is the study of personhood. So they are, in their personhood, they are equal, but they are functionally subordinate to one another. So Jesus obeys the Father, the Spirit obeys the Son, okay? So this is how they operate. But in the same way that in a, in a marriage covenant context um, that uh, the Apostle Paul would call, you know, wives submit to your husbands. Um, it's not a, because they are lesser than, uh, it's just an order. So they are, onto, you know, men and women are ontologically equal. And yet within the marriage covenant, there are forms of functional subordination. And yet again, just for anyone out there thinking, oh, what's that mean? But then men serve. So there's this uh, also the, the servanthood framework. But anyway, that's not what the sermon's on today. So he is a member of the Holy, he is a person, he is God, he he comes as a person and, and yep, so that's who he is. Where is the Holy Spirit? Anyone know? I've lost him. Yeah. He He resides in every born again Christian. 
So when you become a Christian, and again, this isn't, doesn't necessarily mean when you might have prayed a prayer at an altar call, but when you are born again, when you are made new by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes and He makes His home in you. So He resides in every born again Christian. And I'll just read some scriptures for you that outline this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. It says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? So when we look at the Old Testament and under the Old Covenant, there was a physical temple and that was where the Spirit or the presence of God would dwell. And that was an image of what was to come where God would then establish His temple inside every believer. So you are a mobile temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, does God manifest and show up outside of you at different times and places? Can He do that? Absolutely, He can. But I think the primary uh, way of God interacting and dwelling with His people is to reside in them. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. So this is where Paul is saying, don't walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the Spirit of God, uh, which is an important part. It's kind of a bit of the framework of what we're talking about here is that you would walk in obedience to the presence of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 says, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So we are the temple of the living God. I think that's one of the most profound realities for a Christian is that we have become a dwelling place of God. How phenomenal and amazing that is. I think it's an untapped reality um, that a lot of us, that we don't walk in the fullness of that reality. I think sometimes even as Christians, we can continue to seek for God and look for Him, even maybe look for Him in a place or look for Him in an encounter or look for Him in another person, maybe sharing with us. But the reality is that He dwells in us. It's amazing. Anyone else amazed by that or just me? You are welcome to be animated, to make noise, to say things in response even. Okay? There you go. Well, ooh, ah. So we know who He is. We know where He is. And then what is the role of Holy Spirit? Now, Holy Spirit has a number of roles um, in, in our relationship with Him. One of them, and, and one that I want to point out today, is that the Bible calls Him the Spirit of truth. And one of His roles is to lead us into truth. So He is the Spirit of truth and He will lead us into all truth. Uh, If you want to look up a great little section is 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and the start of chapter 3. But it talks about what it's, what you know, kind of who the Holy Spirit is, but that He knows all of the thoughts of God. And that's why we have, have you ever heard the phrase, you have the mind of Christ? In the context of that passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it's talking about the Holy Spirit who knows all the thoughts of God. And he says that same Holy Spirit dwells in you. So essentially, you have access to all the thoughts of God. That's what it is to have the mind of Christ, means you have the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit knows all of Jesus' thoughts. Jesus knows all the Father's thoughts because they are one. And yet all the thoughts of God dwell in you by the Spirit of God. So if you wanna know something, that's a really good place to start. It's to start by asking the Holy Spirit. And where is He? He's dwelling in you. Phenomenal, amazing, okay? Obviously, we need to be aware that just because you say, well, I'll just pay attention to my internal dialogue and make the assumption that it's the Holy Spirit, there's a relationship that's going on inside of you. There's two people, two spirits even. There's uh, your spirit and there's Holy Spirit. And there may be a few other spirits as well. I'm not judging, just saying. This, you know, uh, we can deal with that though. Um, that's what Elijah House is for. That's what prayer. That's what deliverance is for. It's okay. Um, but what we have is we have we have our personal spirit and we have the Holy Spirit, and they commune together. The Bible talks about that they've become one, like in a marriage covenant. The Holy Spirit has become one with our spirit. But then we also have a mind that is has been corrupted by sin and and bad knowledge of stuff. We have a heart and emotions that have been uh, you know abused and affected and impacted by life in the world. So we have an internal dialogue that's not necessarily always pure, but part of our journey of following 
Jesus is being transformed, our mind being renewed, our heart being healed so that we can more clearly hear the Holy Spirit. So when I say that if we stop the sermon there, said, I got the Holy Spirit in me, if, therefore whatever's in me, whatever I think about in my internal dialogue, that, that must be God and I'll go do that. I'm saying it, it's not that simple and not that easy. It's a journey of learning to hear His voice, learning to recognise, oftentimes it's actually learning to recognise what's my voice and what's the voice of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm gonna give you some tips as to how to do that. John chapter 15, verse 26 says, but when the helper comes, so the Holy Spirit is called our helper. Um, It says, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father. So this is a promise of Jesus. One thing I know about Jesus is he's really good at keeping his promises. Okay, so he has promised that he'll send the Spirit from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father and He will bear witness about me. So we know the Holy Spirit is always bearing witness about Jesus. He's always revealing Jesus to us and desiring to reveal Jesus to the world. John chapter 16, verse 12 to 15. Have I got the whole thing up there? Oh, there we go. I'll read a bit on either side of it. It says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever authority he hears, sorry, whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So there's even things as Jesus is sharing with his disciples, it's like, there's actually more things that you need to know. There's more things that you need to understand, but actually you you can't even hear them right now. But I'm gonna send my spirit as I go. Jesus even said, it's better that I leave because when I leave, I'll send my spirit. Now for me, I'm like, man, I feel like in my mind to think about it, I'd prefer to have Jesus right next to me. Like if Jesus could follow me around everywhere, can you imagine that? Imagine if Jesus went to work with you, He's driving in the car with you, He's sitting down, how cool would that be? But there would be a sense of confidence to be like, man, I like Jesus has got my back. I'll walk down a dark alley, no worries. You know, nothing's nothing's gonna affect me because I've got Jesus with me. But from Jesus' perspective, He's like, it's actually better that I go. I'm gonna go to the Father, I'm gonna send the Spirit, it's actually better for you. So there's something in that, again, maybe an untapped reality for us that this, the reality of Holy Spirit dwelling in us is even better than having Jesus with us. But He declares everything that the Father wants to say, everything that Jesus has to say. Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth, given to us to lead us into all truth. A question you might ask is, but Brad, maybe you've heard someone say, and they've challenged us, like, well, if we have the Bible, do we need the Holy Spirit? Like, do we still need the Holy Spirit? That was maybe good for back then, but do we really need the Holy Spirit today? Because we've got the Bible and God's revealed in the Bible. We can just study the Bible, read the Bible, understand God through the Bible, okay. Do we still need the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes. The reason why, yes, oh, that's good. (laughs) Um, So the Bible has not and cannot replace the presence of God Himself. Um, there's like one kind of scripture that talks about when the perfect has come, the imperfect has passed away, all that sort of stuff that people would use to deny the role and the outworking and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit today, okay? Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would come and He promised that He would stay and that He would lead you through, okay, and continue. There, is, there was no time limit that Jesus ever spoke on to say, hey, the Holy Spirit's gonna come for a little bit, mainly probably just, you know, the first kind of, generation of of apostles, they're gonna write down a whole bunch of stuff and then he's gonna go again, okay? You won't find that in the Bible, okay? So all of the promises that Jesus said he would come, all of the things that the Holy Spirit revealed, it's designed that he would continue to live in us and to be manifestly present in our lives. Another thing is when it comes to understanding the Bible, we cannot rightly and properly understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit. If you think we can, my question would be, what about all of the cults and all of the alternate religions that are based upon the Bible that create an interpretation of it that to you and I would think, oh, that's not true, that's not right. Because you can twist and distort something. There is so much content in the Bible. 
that you can take that and, I mean, even just trying to study it and learn it yourself, you've probably gone, man, there's stuff I'm like, ah, that, that doesn't, how does that work and how does that make sense and how do I apply that? Like there is so much in it that the Bible is a record of the activity of God at a certain time, a period in history. So it's good because we can see, hey, this is what God has done. This is what God promises to do. This is what God is like. We see it revealed as we study Jesus, which is next week's one, training in Christ. Like as we study Him, we start to discover, wow, this is what God's like. This is the nature of God is contained in the person of Jesus. Because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we get to know God through that. But what was never meant is that is for the book to replace the author. If you have the author dwelling in you, then why would you deny the author and just focus on the book? Rather than imagine sitting with the author and saying, author, what does this mean? When you wrote this down, what did that mean? When you did this thing, what, what were you meaning there? What were you talking about? Has this, was this promise for me? Yes, this, you know, to, to interact with the author. That's what we're supposed to do when, when it comes to studying or reading the Bible is for it to be present with the author, helping us to understand these truths. Another reason is that Jesus did, never promised to send the Bible. He promised to send his spirit who would lead us into all truth. As I said before, it's important that we don't take that first bit and say, well, I've got the spirit of truth, therefore I don't, I don't need the Bible, I don't need spiritual authority, I don't need anyone. I can just look inside myself and discover, oh, that must be true, therefore I'll do that. That's not helpful <laughs> because you live in you and you're not 100% correct. Okay, I, know, I just heard a whole lot of bubbles burst. Oh my gosh, you serious? That's it, yeah. My wife's been telling me for so long. Um, but that's, that's the truth. So we aren't whole, so we, and we can't rightly see truth. Sometimes it's like you feel like oh, I'm 100% on this and it turns out you're like 14%. Um, so we, we need to understand, hey, we, having an external resource, having a record, oh, that's so good because what we know is God today isn't gonna contradict something he said back then. His nature, God never changes. So who he was back then is who he is today. So having a reference point is good. But if we just say, all Bible, no spirit, that's bad. All spirit, no Bible, that's bad. The combination of the two, sweet spot. Amen? Another thing as well about the Scriptures or the Bible is the Bible is static, but the Holy Spirit is living and active. The Holy Spirit can speak through the Bible but the life that comes from it comes from the Holy Spirit. He is, Jesus is the Word of God. That's what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't talk about the Bible being the Word of God because the Bible didn't exist when the Bible was written. <laughs> it existed uh, like a couple hundred years later, around that time. Um, so, so what we understand is that uh, the Holy Spirit, when He reveals truth from it, the life that we're receiving, the impact, the impartation, the transformation is all the Holy Spirit at work in us, okay? Do we, do we love, are we blessed to have the Bible? There are countries still today on this earth where you cannot even access the Bible. Are we blessed and spoilt because we have access to that? Absolutely. But does that mean then that we put all of our focus and attention on our own ability to interpret historical writings or do we continue to put our 100% trust in the Holy Spirit to lead us into truth even through the Scriptures and the Bible? Yeah, it's just about being healthy in this pursuit. What, what upsets me sometimes is that the pendulum tends to swing one way or the other and you get people who are kind of hyper Bible, Father, Son, Holy Scriptures over this side. And then you get people who are, you know, maybe the hyper charismatics and they tend to then just, oh, Holy Spirit said this and that and whatever. And it's like, mm, sounds funky over there. Not good funky. Not like early Red Hot Chili Peppers funky. Like, <laughs> like the other type of like bad smelling kind of funky. So. That's what I've heard. I've never, I wouldn't listen to such a band. <sighs> I, wasn't, I haven't always been a follower of Jesus. 
There's nothing to do with, I've listened to Red Hot Chili Peppers, but uh, yeah. Um, all right, so Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. This is good, John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Amen. And he says, and I'll ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. So the Holy Spirit is here to help us. It says, to be with you forever. So here's the answer. How long is the Holy Spirit gonna be around for? Forever and ever and ever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. You know Him for He dwells with you and will be in you. Amen. It's amazing. All right, here's a really important point that you need to understand. You can hear from the Holy Spirit. Okay, take your finger. Okay, point it to yourself and say, I can hear from the Holy Spirit. Well done. That is a promise from God is that you can hear from Him. It's really, really important. If you feel like you can't hear from Him, if you're like, I'm a born again Christian, I've received the Holy Spirit, I can't hear from God, you, there's a lie has come in somehow in your journey with God, okay? And we're gonna break that lie today. John chapter 10, verse three and four, it talks about his sheep hearing his voice. It says, the sheep hear his voice. You're a sheep. I won't make it, everyone point yourself and go, bah. <laughs> um, you're, you're his sheep. And what do his sheep do? His sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. I'm a sheep, I hear his voice. My sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. That's John 10, 27 goes on. So again, maybe you might say, I've never heard from God. I've never heard from God. So you say, I can hear from him, I've just never heard from him. My question would be, how much time have you spent learning to hear from him? Uh, like not, not much time. Well, then again, it's possibly you're not able to hear him. In the same way to hear and understand a different language, to interpret it, it requires time immersing yourself in the process of learning and understanding that, okay? So the Holy Spirit speaks in the, in the spirit realm. So it's tuning into the spiritual dimension, okay? So that's not what we're normally, if you grow up, even like I do, grew up in a, in a household where spirituality wasn't part of our kind of everyday life, to learn then how to hear from the Spirit of God. When I'm, I'm, I use this thing, my ears, okay, my eyes, I use my natural senses to engage with the world. Now I'm trying to use these different senses to engage with God. And yet God can use our natural physical senses as well in order to communicate. But it means I have to position myself to learn His voice. That's the only way. I mean, I would love it if he's, can he just break through, just grab me by the scruff of the shirt and scream at me, okay? He, he could, um, but what he tends to do is invite you into that journey, invite you into that relationship because when Jesus called his disciples, he says, hey, you come and follow me. And there had to be a choice, a decision to come and follow. It's the same with following the leading of the Holy Spirit. There's an invitation but then it requires you to do the responding action in pursuing and learning and hearing His voice. The reason why we would seek to hear His voice is in order that He can lead us in our everyday lives. Romans 8, 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. All who are led by the Spirit. So we're called again as Christians to be led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit goes and we follow after Him. He sets the direction, He sets the trajectory, He sets the destination. Our job is to follow. It's not up to us to invite Him on our journey. We have been invited on His journey. Amen? Yeah. All right, so how do we learn to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit? One really important principle that we find in the book of John is to abide with God. John 15 verses four to five says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing of significance unless you're connected to God. So abiding means staying connected. We can think of abiding as, as kind of sitting in one spot. It's not about um, being static and motionless. It's about staying connected. And in this context, it's staying relationally connected to God. So to abide in the vine. Now you're not a vine in terms of like, you don't just hang there on a trellis and you know, do nothing. We're moving, we're, we're people, we go about from day to different places, different relationships, but it's in all of those contexts, staying relationally connected to the vine, staying relationally connected to God. So like the branch of a vine, if it becomes disconnected from the vine, it loses its source of life. It cannot bear fruit because the nutrients that supplies it has been cut off and it will eventually die. So it's the same for us. If we say, okay, I, I, I connect with God in a moment and then I kind of disconnect and do my week and I'm expecting that God's going to produce good things in my life, well, he, he kind of can't because I've cut myself off from him in a sense. I'm not relationally abiding with him in every moment of every day. So God's like, hey, go speak to that person. Oh, sorry, you're not listening. Hey, there's a blessing around the corner. Oh, you missed it. Um, could, you, could you go and share with that person? I want them to know my love. Oh, you're too busy. You know, God's like, he's, we, we, we're not tuning in and listening. So we miss all of those opportunities to produce and bear good fruit in our lives, to connect and relate to God in every moment because we've kind of just gone off and done our own thing. We've snipped ourselves off in a sense from the vine and we're just this floating kind of branch going around doing stuff. And then we can have moments like, oh, I'm feeling a bit dry, feeling a bit crusty in my relationship with Jesus. Okay, I, need, I need to go back on a Sunday. And then, ah, oh, yes, this is what it's like. And the nutrient starts flowing. And then Monday morning, wake up, cut myself off, go about, you know, it gets to Saturday night, like, oh, I'm all crusty and dry again. Like, that's not what we're supposed to, that's not life we're supposed to be living. We're supposed to be staying connected, staying relationally connected to God. When we stay connected relationally to God, we stay connected to that source of life and it causes us to produce good fruit in our lives. The good fruit of us being transformed, the good fruit of people hearing the gospel, the good fruit of walking in peace and love and all of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Who would like some of that fruit in their life? Yeah, it's not, it's not found. All of those things are truly found in God, but they're found when you stay connected to the vine, when you abide with Him. And again, it's not about becoming a hermit and isolating yourself. Okay, I'm just gonna lock myself in a room and just sit with God all day, every day. It's not about that. It's about staying connected to God regardless of the circumstance that you're in. So if you're at home, you're relationally abiding with God. If you're at work, you're relationally abiding with God. You go into the gym, you're relationally abiding. To, you're playing sport, you're doing whatever you're doing, you're in that sphere. You're buying shoes, you're relationally abiding with God. And again, it's not about abiding on a Sunday and then living disconnected the rest of the week. We can do that sometimes, unfortunately. It's when, you, when you're at work, when you're driving, when you're doing the grocery shopping, when you're hanging out with friends, it's in all of those times that I'm staying connected to God. I'm learning Him, I'm listening, I'm looking for opportunities to obey Him. He's gonna speak to me, He's gonna want me to share things with other people. And here's the thing, when we, when we connect with God, when we have that intimate connection, intimacy has an outworking. But that outworking is birthed from the place of intimacy. So when we're, when we're connected to God, when we are relationally staying connected with Him, there is an outworking, there's fruit that comes out of that. But all of that fruit is contained in the vine, it's contained in that place of connection. So the public expression of your faith is birthed in your private interaction with the Holy Spirit. 
and I mean private, it could be in a room filled with people, you're, you're still privately relating to the Holy Spirit. You're li- still listening for His voice. And then you're becoming attuned to His voice that you can hear it in any opportunity. So Holy Spirit is active in both places and He can be found in both places. You may just not recognize him at work in the marketplace if you haven't learned his voice in the quiet place. So God is present in the marketplace and he's present in the quiet place. God's not sitting in a cupboard somewhere waiting for you to find him, okay? When you go into a quiet place, when you go somewhere to be alone with God, you're taking God with you. If you imagine, you're, it's like you're drawing him aside and you're saying, hey, Holy Spirit, we're gonna come over here and just have some alone time together because he's going with you. He's not waiting there. Oh, when's Brad gonna show up? He's always with you, but you're, you're drawing yourself aside because it's like, I'm, I'm not hearing your voice right now, Holy Spirit. It's getting muddled up. Maybe my own internal dialogue or what's kind of happening all around me, my circumstance is causing me to start to listen to other voices and I'm losing my sensitivity to your voice. I think you and I, we just need to go and spend some time alone so I can tune back into hearing your voice so that your voice would be louder than any other voice in the world. So the way that we learn to hear from Holy Spirit is by setting aside time to learn the sound of His voice. So again, part of abiding and the rhythm of abiding is is the setting apart of time to be with Holy Spirit on your own, not so that's the only time that you interact with Him, but so that you learn His voice that as you then go out, you recognise His voice. Because the reality is in the world that we live in, there is a whole lot of noise. There are a whole lot of uh, entities uh, trying to draw your attention, whether that's media, marketing, people around you and relationships. And then there's the whole spiritual realm of principalities and powers and territorial spirits and all that sort of stuff. There's just noise in the atmosphere. But there's one voice that you need to hear above all other voices, and that's the voice of the Holy Spirit. So we learn in the quiet so that we can hear when it's noisy. If you don't know it, if you don't know Him in the quiet place, it's gonna be very hard to hear Him when you're surrounded by noise. You know, it's like for me, um, like I know the sound when my kids cry, I just, I've just learned the sound of their cries. And you would have seen this, if you've ever been to like a, like a kid's party or around where there's lots of kids and you hear a kid crying and you're like, mm, no, that's not my kid. <laughs> I don't need to care, it's not my child. But you can kind of hear, say, oh, I shut off, yes, that's one of my kids. Um, but you know, like you, you learn, so it could be, there could be 100 kids and you, you can pick out the sound of your kid crying because you're just so familiar with that because You've heard it up close and personal <laughs> so often in your house. You know, it's loud. It's like, wow, it's been bored into my soul. <laughs> it's not that bad, really. Um, but you know, like you've become so familiar because you've been in an, in an isolated situation where there's, there's three different cries that my kids have and I've learned them really well. So then when we're out in a crowded room, one of my kids, you can just kind of say, oh, that's, and that's one of our kids. So, is that, understand? Yeah, that's good, all right. So learning his voice involves childlike obedience. So it's through obedience that we learn how well we've heard, okay? So it's, well, I think the Holy Spirit's telling me to, to do something. Now, if the Holy Spirit's telling you to sell all of your possessions, quit your job and move to a foreign country, that's probably one where, Maybe don't test that. Maybe test that with a few wise people. Give us some time. Seek some confirmation from other sources. Don't then just go, I'll oh, just give it, give it a crack. See if it's the Holy Spirit. Because uh, if it turns out that it's not and you misheard, there's some pretty significant consequences. But I'm talking about in the little things. Like, oh, I feel like the Holy Spirit wants me to, to do this thing. I feel like He wants me to bless this person. I feel like He wants me to, to, to go to this. Whatever it might be in the little things that you start to do that. And then you find the fruit that comes from that. And sometimes the fruit, the simple fruit of obedience is obedience. So obedience is sometimes the only fruit that God wants to bring out of your obedience. I've often said, it's like you're driving down the street and you feel, I feel like Holy Spirit wants me to turn left here. And I turn left and then, oh, there's, there's nothing. I remember talking, it's like, God, well, well, what was the point of that? Well, the point was that I obeyed. 
Oh, wow, I learned obedience. That's what I learned in that interaction is to obey him. He didn't, he, he said, I didn't have anything for you. I just wanted to ask you to turn left and see if you would. And I did. So that's sometimes how simple it can be. But if we go, no, I'm just gonna wait till I know it's God. I'm gonna wait till it's like one, 100% this Holy Spirit, then I'll do it, okay? You're never gonna do it. Because even people that I know who like, I'm like, man, I think that person is super clearly from Holy Spirit, and yet sometimes they get it wrong. Like no one's 100% in hearing the voice of God. And if they tell you they are, they've misheard. <laughs> You know, we can all hear, but our hearing isn't perfect. It's a learning process. It, it will always involve trust to obey. It'll always involve you trusting God. Because again, it's never 100%. So you can't trust yourself. It's not about, well, I know. It's like, I've just got to trust you, Holy Spirit. I'm going to take a step. I'm going to see, oh, yes, it was. Okay, no, I missed that one. But the more that we do that, we get familiar. I, I recognize your voice now, but part of me learning your voice is seeing the fruit that comes out of that obedience. And again, Holy Spirit won't tell you to do things that contradict the Bible, but at times He'll probably tell you to do things that make you feel uncomfortable. The reason why the Holy Spirit is called the Comforter is because there's an expectation that as you follow Him, you're gonna need His comfort. Okay, he's, it means he's going to make you uncomfortable. Now, Holy Spirit would never lead me into a bad situation. What was the first thing the Holy Spirit led Jesus to do? Yeah, 40 days in the wilderness getting tempted by Satan. It says he gets baptized in the Holy Spirit and the, Holy, the Bible literally says the Holy Spirit leads him out into the wilderness to fast for 40 days to be tempt, and to be tempted by Satan. <laughs> So again, I'm not saying he's gonna call you to do that, <laughs> but he is more than likely gonna tell you to do things that make you feel uncomfortable. Just need, we just need to sink that in. Okay, I, I should have an expectation, not an unhealthy expectation, but I should assume he's not just, oh, I think the Holy Spirit's telling me to do that, but that would make me feel a bit uncomfortable, so it mustn't be him. <laughs> nope, it's more than likely probably him. Oh, he wants me to go and talk to that person. Oh, that, I feel embarrassed. He, he, he doesn't care. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, but that's, obedience is, is bigger than embarrassment. Like, then you've got to choose. It's like, well, I'll either be embarrassed and obey or I won't be embarrassed and I'll be disobedient. The level of comfort in what he calls you to do is, is irrelevant. It's like, okay, that's gonna make me really uncomfortable, but I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are my comfort. My identity is in you. And you will comfort me as I do this. As I go over and maybe I'll humiliate myself. And oh, humiliation. That's good. Humility. That's good because then it makes me more like Jesus. Maybe that's the point. Just saying. <laughs> hearing and obeying always go together. There's no point hearing His voice if you're not prepared to obey. So you get, oh yes, I'd love to hear from Holy Spirit. Well, if He talks to you, He's gonna expect you to do what he says. I love that again. I think it was Bill Johnson that says, um, if you feel like you're not hearing the voice of God, he's like, well, I used to hear the voice of God, but I just feel like I haven't been hearing from him lately. He's like, go back to the last thing that he told you to do and do that. And then he might give you the next instruction. <laughs> I sometimes do that with my kids. <laughs> I'll give them an instruction. They come down, they're like, well, you haven't, do that, do that thing first. The first thing I told you, and then we'll, we'll do next instruction. Um, but that's, you know, we, I just lay out, you just lay out all of the instructions for the rest of my life, God, and then I'll just work my way through it. It's like, no, no, you do this one and you trust and you obey, and then you do the next one. But if we're not prepared to obey, even as Jesus said, those who hear my words and do them, they are wise builders. Those who hear my words and don't do them are foolish builders. So as I've said many times before, you can hear the voice of God and be more foolish than you were before you heard the voice of God if you don't obey Him. So, so important that we come into the hearing with expectation, I'm gonna, I'm gonna obey. All right, here's some practical abiding time tips. So again, remember, we're learning Him in the quiet so we can hear Him when it's noisy. The point isn't just to then set apart I know I've got some respite time with Holy Spirit and then I'll go about the rest of my week. No, it's learning Him in that place so we can apply Him in everyday life.
Amen? All right. First one is get alone. So it, it's helpful to remove distractions and interruptions where possible. Okay? So just find a, a, an alone space. So you don't have to be sitting in a closet. <laughs> um, you could go for a walk. You could go and sit on the beach. Just do something that doesn't involve your focus on that activity so that you can focus on listening to Holy Spirit. Okay? If you struggle to walk five metres without tripping over something, maybe a walk's not a good idea for you. Okay? If you need to focus your attention, right, one, right left. Yeah, that's not a good, you know, all I'm saying is, so you can be doing something. I know for me, I, like, I, I find it hard just to sit in one place. Okay? So I like to be moving. So you can be moving, but just do a movement sort of activity, not archery, that's what I'm saying, you know? So something, something that's not archery, do something that doesn't, isn't gonna distract you, okay? Um, you, might, might, you might find it helpful to play some worship music. You might find it helpful to read your Bible, to listen to an audio Bible, something like that at the beginning, but that's essentially, it's not for studying. If you're gonna listen to the Bible, read the Bible, don't do it for study, do it just to get yourself tuned in to God listening in to what he's saying. It's for focusing your mind and your heart on him. Then pray. So talk to Holy Spirit. Pray that your heart, your mind, your body and your spirit would come to rest and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you. You could say things like, thank you, Holy Spirit, that you speak to me and that you've created me to be able to hear your voice. Even as a declaration of yourself, I just thank you, Holy Spirit, that you've created me to hear from you. So I'm not searching, I'm not asking you to do something that you're not already willing and planning to do, but I'm just gonna position myself to hear. If you're someone and you, and you, you know, oftentimes I hear from people and I've done it myself and it's like I sit down and, okay, he's gonna focus on Holy Spirit and listen to his voice and then I start thinking about oh, that thing at work that I've got to do and, 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 and that thing I'd really wanna eat for lunch and, I, my, you know, your, your mind starts kind of wandering and then you, oh, sorry, no, and then I go, the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, focus, 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 focus. And then I'm over here thinking about this thing, you know? And you get frustrated and then you do that for 15 minutes. You go, oh, this is a waste of time. I just can't stay focused on the Holy Spirit. So what's the point in doing this? My encouragement is if you find your mind wandering or focusing on other things, so your cares, concerns, whatever it is, then invite Holy Spirit into that conversation. Because sometimes it might actually be, you're like, Holy Spirit, talk to me. And then I'm thinking about, this relationship issue. And they're like, oh no, keep coming back. Holy Spirit, talk to me. And he's like, I'm trying. I wanna talk to you about this relationship issue. And you keep bringing it back to me. You know? It might be that he's wanting you to focus on it. Or what's being revealed in that time is, this is what's concerning my heart right now. Holy Spirit, would you talk to me about this situation? I'm really concerned about my friend who's, who's really, really unwell. I just can't stop thinking about them. Holy Spirit, would you come and talk to me about this situation? And you could ask him then things, Holy Spirit, what do you think about this situation? Or Holy Spirit, what is your solution to this problem that I'm facing? Or Holy Spirit, what are you trying to teach me through this situation? So instead of just saying, um, keep bringing it back, say, Holy Spirit, we're just gonna go on a journey. So thank you that you wanna speak into these situations, that you care about them. So let your, if your mind is wandering, invite him into the wander. After you've done that, you've had some time of interaction, then record in some way what you feel like Holy Spirit is saying to you. It might seem innocuous, it might just seem silly or whatever, just write it down. This is what I feel like He's saying to me. You could have a journal, so write it on with pen and paper. It could be your notes app on your phone, do a voice memo, something like that. However, you can take that, what you've been processing with God and get it down in some form that you can come back to. It's really important. And then if Holy Spirit gives you something to obey, find a way to keep yourself accountable to that obedience. I feel like Holy Spirit's telling me to do this thing. Cool, I'll try and remember to do that. I'm saying make that a priority. So put a, tell a friend, hey, I feel like Holy Spirit's wanting me to, to do this. Can you keep me accountable to that? Put a reminder in your phone, do something that's going to keep you on track with actually walking in obedience with anything that He's told you to do. Amen? So we've got them all. get alone, tune in, pray, wander and wonder, record and obey. I was gonna try and come up with an acronym, but do you want us to be bothered? No, we've got enough acronyms going on at the moment, so. 
All right, so our activation challenge for this week is to set apart... Smoking. Uh, all right. Our activation challenge for this week... No, I didn't do it again. Uh, set apart time to abide with Holy Spirit this week, learning to hear His voice and obeying what He says. So that's our activation challenge. It's for each of us to set apart time. You can do it daily. You can do it once. You could set apart a larger chunk of time, okay? Now, again, this is not about, okay, well, if I do this, then it's, I'm gonna hear perfectly and it's all gonna be great. It, it might be a struggle. It might be uncomfortable. It might cause you to change up a rhythm. It might mean altering your life in some way, okay? I wanna encourage you that this is how the world will be transformed, okay? It's not by having great church gatherings, okay? It's by people, every one of God's children, hearing His voice and doing what He says. That's how God's will will be done. When you follow His will, how do I know His will? Because I know His voice and I know to obey what He says. That's radical transformation of the entire world. It's how simple it is. So if you're thinking, is it really that important to hear His voice? Yeah, it is. <laughs> For His will to be done, it, it requires us knowing His will and walking in His will. Amen? All right, why don't you stand? I'm gonna pray. Oh, do you have questions? All right, sorry. You can sit again. I'll do some questions. Can we pray to Holy Spirit instead of to Jesus, etc.? Yes. He's God. Um, so He is, is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. When I pray, I just bounce around between all three of them. I figure they'll let each other know. Um, <laughs> so... Did you hear what Brad prayed today? No, I wasn't there. I was busy doing something else. Um, so he's part of the Godhead. They're all, yeah, they're all God. So yes, you can. Uh, should we praise and worship the Holy Spirit? Yeah, I think again, he's God. So it's, it's Father, Son, and Spirit. I think again, where there are, there's relational dynamics that exist between them. I think there are, um, aspects of God that are revealed through each part of the Godhead that I think is helpful for us in how we relate. So who Father God is, He is the same as Jesus and yet there can be a way that I interact with Jesus and a way that He ministers to me that can be different than to how the Father ministers to me or how Holy Spirit ministers to me. Um, there is, as part of the, I think it's in all of the Sozo training, the inner healing stuff, and they, I think it's called the Father Ladder, is that that one? Which is how Father God can be uh, familiar and represented by your earthly father, so the relationship with your earthly father. Um, Jesus is like your siblings and Holy Spirit is your mother. It's not, they, they are not those people, but it means that if the, you had relational trauma or issues or lack in your relationship with your mother in the earthly sense, then that can create a barrier to your being able to healthily relate to the Holy Spirit. Same with your earthly father, because Father God, it's Father, Father was, well, I mean, my, maybe for you, it's like more my father was abusive and absent. That's all I know of a father. So then it's natural to relate that, well, that's kind of what Father God is like, because he calls himself Father. So, so it, it's... Um, that was a sidetrack, but yeah, he, he is God, so he's, we can praise Him and worship Him, all of them together. Uh, how do you start positioning yourself to listen to Holy Spirit? Do you do the same things now or has it changed? Also, how, do, how did you start positioning yourself? Whew. Um, it is a very good question. I, I, I don't know. Um, and yes, it has changed. I, I find it hard to be consistent in doing anything. Um, even driving the same way somewhere is hard for me. So to get into, I think for me, the, the drawing away rhythm is probably the hardest thing. It's my deepest longing, but it's the hardest thing for me to do. 
uh, because I'm wired within me, and this is not an excuse, but I have to acknowledge how I am wired, is to, to build and to move and to do. So to draw back and to be quiet and still uh, is, is it's just a wrestle for me, an internal wrestle. So for me, what, I've, um, what I need to do is to recognize that he is present. So I'm like, but I, so I, I also talk to him in, in the shower and I talk to him when I'm driving. So there'll be times where I'll just be like, the radio's on, turn the radio, sit in silence and just talk to God in those moments. So for me, I, I have to take into account who I am and God's grace and mercy towards me. Um, but how, because if I'm just looking for Him and saying, I didn't get, I didn't set apart a quiet time, so therefore I'm not able to hear from God, um, is, is, then I'm, I'm saying, well, I'm not hearing in every other place. I'm like, no, I hear from God all the time in lots of different circumstances. For me, my desire, and that's, you know, even in this is like, but I want to have those times where I'm just, I'm going to go for a, on a walk with God. I'm going to sit and be present because I want to hear more clearly the voice of God, okay? I don't, uh, you know, yeah, I think for me, it's, it's, I used to downplay what I, I just thought, oh, that's just in me. Because sometimes the voice of God will become familiar to you that he'll sound just like you. Um, and that, again, the more that you pursue, I've pursued a healing journey, an inner healing journey, get my heart right, because I want to get me out of the way so that I can hear more clearly. And I've had crazy break, like, encounters with God in those prayer ministry sessions, like stuff where God has led me through prophetic encounters that I would never have put that together in my mind, okay? And there's been breakthrough there. Um, but there's still a journey of knowing what it is to, to commune in that place. And I can't, I, I can't tell too much of my story, you know, because it relates to my earthly relationships. But that was a big one for me as I I saw God in an encounter and he was inviting me to come and sit at the table. But for me, I was like, but isn't, I mean, takeaway is as good as dining, isn't it? Like really, it's the same food. If you go to a restaurant and say, I'd like takeaway versus I'd like to sit and have a meal, the food's the same, the company's different. So that for me is part of my healing journey is learning what it is to just commune with the Father and sit and spend time with Him rather than just always being active in doing what He wants me to do or building what He has to build. It's learning that. So that for me is part of my healing journey. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Thanks for your questions, people. Wonderful. All right, let's pray. Now we can pray. All right. Well, we thank you for your indwelling presence, Holy Spirit. And Lord, I just wanna even start by praying if there's anyone here who wants to invite the Holy Spirit to come and live in them, would you just pray with me to say, Holy Spirit, I invite you to come and make your home in me. I desire to be a temple, a dwelling place of your presence. So would you come and would you make me new? Would you make me a new creation? And would you abide in me? Would you make me to be born again by your grace? In Jesus' name. And we just trust your Holy Spirit to move, to move as you desire to move, Lord. We cannot manipulate you, Holy Spirit. We cannot tell you what to do because you are God and we are not. But we seek and we desire to obey you, Holy Spirit. And we thank you that as Jesus promised, as is written clearly in the Bible, Lord, that we can hear your voice and you are speaking to us, Lord. So, Holy Spirit, I pray and I ask that you would come and you would open up deaf ears in Jesus' name. Would you come and open up spiritually deaf ears, Lord, where there are things blocking our ability to hear. We just pray, Holy Spirit, would you come and would you open deaf ears, Lord? Whatever it is, Lord, that is blocking our ability to hear you, would you come and would you deal with that now? Thank you, Jesus. And I pray, Lord, over every person's spirit, Lord, 
as we know that we are spirit, soul and body, Lord, but in that place of residing and connection, Lord, that You come and You dwell with our personal spirit, Lord. And I just pray a blessing over every spirit here, Lord, every personal spirit. I just, I command a blessing over you and I call you forth to be prominent over the heart, over the mind. Would you come forth? Would you come awake now in Jesus' Name? Would you come out of that place of captivity? Would you come forward? Would you come forward now in Jesus' Name? Come forward. Let your voice be heard. We bless you. We bless your moment of conception. We bless your moment of birth. We speak blessing and healing over every trauma that you've endured, every trauma of lack, any trauma of abuse, every neglect. Would you come Holy Spirit and minister to that deep place, Lord? But we call forth your Spirit. Would it come to the forefront? We thank you, Lord, that we are designed to live Spirit first. Lord, that our mind would take a back seat, Lord, that our heart would take a back seat and that our spirit would be forward, Lord. Being led by You. Holy Spirit, would You help us to make a commitment to set apart time to listen to You this week? And would You give us courage to obey what You say? Oh Lord, how good it is going to be that we can hear Your voice, Lord, that we can talk to You and we can hear You respond. And we can live, Lord, in those everyday moments of interacting with You. We thank You, Lord, that You care about our everyday lives. You care about the problems that we're facing and You have things to say. You have answers and solutions, but You wanna do it in a partnership, Lord, with us, hearing what You have to say and walking in obedience to that. So we thank You, Lord, that we are Your children, that we are Your sheep and we hear Your voice. And Father, I just speak a blessing over Your people today. All those who are watching by video at some other time in the week, would You be blessed to go and to hear the voice of God and to walk with Him in Your every day. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Awesome. Bless you, wonderful people.